When Assassin's Creed Valhalla was first revealed, I was very conflicted. On the one hand, I loved the idea of the Viking setting. I thought the story taking place in 9th century England with the Vikings who had traveled to many, many places, including many settings we had already seen in games before, would be a great way to tie into the rest of the series and provide some really cool connecting storylines. On the other hand, the reveal trailer and really the marketing in general showed almost exclusively the Viking fantasy, and the only time we saw a hooded figure was with a mythical god, which out of context was not a great way to appeal to Assassin's Creed fans considering how little that actually fits into the series, and of course the only time we saw Hidden Blade was in a last ditch effort in open combat in a CGI trailer, which I don't think I uh, need to tell you that that's not quite how assassins roll, I'm just saying. So I was very conflicted. There were some days during the lead up to the game that I felt like I just didn't care about the game. I was disinterested. I had thought the series was truly lost to time and greed. But on the other hand, there was something that kept me going, something that kept me interested, and that was the passion of a lot of the developers, particularly the lead narrative director in Darby McDevitt. You see, the entire Assassin's Creed part of the marketing was essentially done through him. Any questions we had about how mythology would be handled or how it would tie into other Assassin's Creed games, he had the answers and he was directly involved in interacting with the community and helping to honestly alleviate a lot of our concerns regarding this game. But at the end of the day, there was still a tight rope to walk. Was this intended for people that just wanted a big open world Viking adventure with a nice huge world to go out and explore and collect loot and upgrade gear and call it a day as we flash around with our pretty colors and big damage numbers? Or was this for people who enjoy Assassin's Creed, the Assassin's vs. Templar conflict and the philosophies that go along with it, as well as things like advanced movement and social stealth? Who was it for? Eventually the day did come for me to find out what kind of a game Assassin's Creed Valhalla was going to be. Now when you start just about any Assassin's Creed game, there's a few things you want to look for that you're going to be introduced to pretty much right off the bat, and those are the foundations of what makes up the game, at least in a gameplay sense. What those foundations are, are of course movement, exploration, combat, and stealth. These don't make up the entirety of what the game is going to be. You can have a couple of them be bad and the rest of the game be good and vice versa. But the first one I want to start off with is movement because this is typically the first thing you're introduced to in any game is how to move and how does it feel to move. Well, the parkour in the past couple of games has been pretty lackluster, which is disappointing, especially since the series is kind of the one that revolutionized what it means to have good movement in gaming as a whole. Most games try to focus on having some kind of free climbing or just climbing in general now because it looks so interesting and it is so fun and adds such a sense of verticality. And that's all thanks to the original Assassin's Creed as well as the Ezio trilogy that introduced so many people to those kinds of mechanics and how much fun it can be to pull off some amazing parkour maneuvers. Now the issue with the past couple of titles and it's retained in this one is just how streamlined it is. It's not interesting to go around doing parkour, in fact it's almost kind of boring if I'm being honest. And that's disappointing, I mean if you just go on YouTube and look up guys like Leo K or Memento Gallery, you can see that there are channels who have built themselves off of the fact that the depth of the parkour and the movement in a lot of these games, especially Unity and some of the like Ezio Trilogy and Assassin's Creed 1, they've been able to build their communities based off of how deep the movement is and just how good and sad satisfying it looks to see someone who has been able to master the depth of these games and pull off some of these stunning moves that they can do. As great as it is that this used to be in the games, it's just one more piece of Assassin's Creed's identity that is gone now. There is a little bit more player control now in terms of the movement. You do have an A button that will allow you to jump across certain gaps that you normally wouldn't. Now it is kind of weird because sometimes Eivor will get stuck on something just stupid because you're not holding down the A button even though you 
don't really want to do that all the time. It's kind of a weird thing where you're either going to fall somewhere you don't want to or get stuck on something you don't want to. It's weird. The older games a lot of times did it better because some people made the mistake of always holding down A and that was a problem or they'd never hold down A and just fall off of buildings. There's kind of a nice middle ground you need to have, but it was consistent in those games. Whereas in this game, you might not be able to step over a rock, but you won't jump across a basic area of parkour that you would want to. It's weird and it's not very smooth, which is unfortunate. The other thing that comes back is a sprint button, which makes you move slightly faster. And that's about it. Now, I will say there are a couple of areas where you can do things like back ejects, and that helps a lot with certain puzzles when you're trying to get certain pieces of treasure around the open world, but it's not something that's often utilized. And some of the areas that do seem designed for you to do parkour in them feel a little bit too linear. They definitely feel like you're on a scripted path more so than in the older games where doing parkour is more of an organic act and something you would do when you're escaping from guards or simply just running around the city and some of the things that you could pull off happen just on the fly and in a snap and it wasn't something that was always set. Sure, there were areas where you could see the developers had set up a little parkour course for you, but it was never something that was obvious and scripted all the time. Sure, there's a couple of areas and missions that were, but it wasn't something that you always had to look out for because that was the only way you were going to be able to do those kinds of tricks and have that kind of fun. It was very much something that you had to learn and a skill you had to master to pull off some of those moves on the fly and in a snap. And it could be the difference between life and, well, not really death because I mean the counter buttons basically going to make you immortal so life and immortality with the counter button so again I would like to see more advanced movement in the next game but in this one it's pretty much more of what we've already seen now that we know how to move around this open world and what it's going to take let's talk about some of the things that we're going to be doing as we encounter different things in this open world firstly because this is a fantasy series now let's talk about combat because that comes before stealth in Assassin's Creed who would have thought? Combat in this game is pretty layered, but not in the way that you're thinking. Now, I will say, and I will give props because there is a decent amount of strategy involved in the combat system. Personally, I found that the most important thing was picking the right weapon combination when approaching certain enemies, especially the stronger ones. Outside of that, it's really up to you and what you prefer in terms of what kind of over-exaggerated cartoonish animations you like. There's tons of different weapon combinations, whether it's axe and shield, axe and hidden blade, dual wielding whatever weapons you want, a dagger and a hidden blade. There's so many different combinations that you can put together and each weapon and piece of equipment does have a set of perks that come with it that can be unlocked if you do certain things in combat or even in stealth if it's some of the equipment. But really they didn't play a huge part into the combat system. It really, like I already said, mostly came down to what weapon combination that you had equipped uh, unless you just want to kill an enemy slightly faster or have slightly more health in a fight, which I didn't mind at all because I don't play Assassin's Creed to focus on small perks and abilities. I just want to make my character look like an assassin and go from there and play it as most like an assassin as I can. Now all the depth of the combat kind of ends there outside of weapon combinations, gear combinations, and what kind of perks you want to have equipped. That's it. That's all it takes. And then you get into the cheat codes. These are two layers that will take the combat from being infuriatingly annoying at its very worst and obscenely boring at its very best and somehow make it duller than a rusty hidden blade. Now the combat hinges almost entirely upon one particular ability. Now I didn't equip this ability for most of the game so that's why I got the infuriatingly annoying aspect of things and why so many zealots that I fought against had an unblockable chain of attacks that would drain my stamina bar to the point to where I was just simply torturing myself the entire time but slowly so that I suffered through it and just kind of gave up after a while. Now what is this ability? Well that ability is brush with death. Now there's a few reasons why it breaks the entire combat system and throws away any strategy. Number one, what is brush with death? Well 
All it does is it slows down time when you dodge perfectly, so that's what throws away all the strategy. No longer do you have to think about what weapon you have equipped, no longer do you have to think about what perks you want equipped or what gear you have. No, 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 no. Just dodge perfectly and you're going to slow down time. Now, as you've slowed down time, you can move as freely as you want while the enemy can't do anything. It's kind of like pulling the reverse card. Instead of them torturing you with an unblockable chain of attacks, you can now torture them with an unblockable chain of attacks. Now, this is extremely boring and unsatisfying because there's nothing they can do. There's no challenge to this kind of combat system. You're simply making it to where there's slow motion torture, which is kind of messed up in a little bit of a way, uh, just saying. But most of all, it's very unsatisfying as a combat system. Now, one game that does have a phenomenal combat system is, of course, Ghost of Tsushima. Now, Ghost of Tsushima has one of the best combat systems I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing in a video game. It is simply incredible. Not only are the animations satisfying, but it also plays into not only what the game is about, but also has a massive amount of depth considering you only have one one primary weapon that you can use and a variety of tools that you can use as the ghost. And when you're able to not only invest into simply the katana combat and being able to use the various stances against different enemies and keep the right frame of mind in combat to be able to switch properly to counter those enemies, but also pair that with the ghost weapons in order to clear certain enemies out of an area while you're in a fight in order to focus on others that you have the right stance for or any no Number of things, whether it's the boss fights where being able to attack with the right combo but also defend and dodge with the right combo will open up further attacks. There's a ton to this combat system and a ton that you can do despite only having one primary weapon, and it's phenomenally satisfying. Much like your mom, it will keep me coming back. Now, a lot like Valhalla, Ghost of Tsushima knew it had a samurai fantasy at the forefront. Valhalla knew it was going to have a Viking fantasy at the forefront, which is super no longer weird to say about Assassin's Creed, but it should be. It just feels dirty. But Ghost of Tsushima invested a lot into making an extremely satisfying combat system that fits into the role of what a samurai is. You must keep the right frame of mind to make the most of that combat. And in Valhalla, there's nothing there. Even without Brush with Death, you don't feel like a Viking per se. There's some really cool finishers that are extremely visceral and I love seeing them every single time. Like they never get old and there's different ones for the different weapon combinations and different enemies that you're going to come across. But it still doesn't feel like anything special or unique to what a Viking would be doing aside from simply the brutality that is a part of it. And that doesn't feel genuine and it doesn't feel satisfying. It's just kind of there with its weird over the top overextended animations and flashy colors and damage numbers and that's it. It doesn't feel like the grounded, precise, compact combat system that it needs to be. In previous Assassin's Creed games, and this is something that you may or may not have noticed, but the combat system often reflects the personality of the character in that game. For example, in the first game, Altair was a cold-blooded killer, so his combat system is going to reflect that. Considering the fact that everywhere he went, everyone around him was his enemy, he needed to act as if he had to conserve his stamina and be able to fight multiple enemies at any given time. And so that's how he fights. He doesn't waste his energy, he simply makes the necessary moves in order to get the kill. Ezio, on the other hand, uses a little bit of flash because he's had a little bit of training throughout his life, whether he realized it or not, and he's just generally good at fighting and it reflects his personality to have a little bit of flair to things. Connor is another one that I think should have had some inspiration for this game, but didn't, and that's because Connor fights in a very physical and brutal fashion. That's just because he's one of the more imposing physically characters that we've had in the series, and the way that he's able to not not only pull off these quick and precise moves, but also do it with such force and power, I think is something that is properly reflected in not only who he is, but something that should have been taken into consideration for this game. Just because you have some brutal finishing animations doesn't make the combat necessarily brutal.
show when all of the animations are just over exaggerated cartoon animations. I mean, I'm pretty sure Fortnite has tighter axe animations when you're chopping down wood than this game does, which is such a weird comparison I have to make for Assassin's Creed now, but that's just what it is. And again, overall, it's just, it's very disappointing to see and to experience and just not a fun combat system. Now, the last thing, and I'm just going to go over this quickly, this is the cherry on top of the combat, and that's the flail. Now, of course, the flail is an optional weapon. You don't have to use it, but if you did want to cruise through and chew up every enemy in England very quickly at a very low level, you could by just equipping the flail because, wow, does it chew through everything. I mean, it is ultra easy mode. Combine that with brush with death, just turn off your brain and you will conquer the entire planet. I am not kidding. It is so easy to fight with the flail. Personally, I didn't do it a ton just because I wasn't a big flail guy. I'm more of a uh, axe and hidden blade kind of uh, player. It's a fun little combination to use, but again, it, it's just, it's too easy. It's not very satisfying and honestly just not worth the time. Now on to something that used to be worth the time, should be worth the time, but really isn't in this game. It's something that used to be primary, then got demoted to secondary, and is arguably now a tertiary feature of these games, which is kind of sad. And I'm talking about the stealth systems, and I know some people are already typing, but Jaws, there's social stealth, it's back, it's more than a gimmick. And I'll get to that in a minute, but first I want to talk about the core functions of the stealth in this game. You see, there is a stealth stat attached to gear and that you can upgrade in the skill tree. All that stealth stat has to do is with your ability to do more stealth damage. Now, what is stealth damage? Well, it's essentially any damage you're going to do when enemies haven't detected you, whether that's with your bow or more importantly with your hidden blade, because one hit kills with your hidden blade are not guaranteed anymore. Unless, of course, you have that feature turned on, which was reintroduced in this game. So people who want to play in a more Assassin's Creed kind of old fashioned style of gameplay, they can do that. Now, the problem is the fact that that's the only thing that you can actually do is change your stealth damage which of course having an impact on the bow is nice the bow is kind of your one piece of ranged gear that you have for stealth in this game but for the people who are playing in a more stealth style they're likely to have the one hit kill turned on so the fact that the only stealth stat that you can have an influence on is stealth damage is kind of disappointing especially when you look at the way that detection works in this game you see there's three different areas there's kind of your regular open world there's distrust areas and then there's restricted areas areas. In the open world and in the distrust areas, the stealth does work very nicely. You have a little detection bar and it kind of slowly fills up if you get too close to guards in the distrust areas. And in the open world, they don't detect you unless you do something out of the ordinary. Now that works, but in restricted areas, you're almost instantaneously detected. It's a very dualistic kind of detection system. You're either not detected or you are. Now some ranged enemies, I will say they do have a little bit of a detection bar, but honestly it fills up pretty quickly quickly if you get within line of sight of them and in close quarters it's almost instantaneous so it might as well not even be there and this wouldn't be totally an issue if you could have an impact on an enemy's ability to detect you and that's where the stealth stat should have been changed. It should be more so about an enemy's ability to detect you, whether it's the more difficult enemies who can detect you faster or whether just your standard enemy can detect you at an extremely quick rate. Also, the enemy's ability to forget where you are, or at least say, oh, that must have been nothing and walk away. That should also be something that is taken into consideration. Now, there's a lot of important features that are tied to a detection bar. You can move enemies to places where you would want them, whether for a kill or just to simply get around them by using such a thing. It was a feature that was used often in a lot of the early games, really from the Ezio trilogy on. Maybe in AC3 it was a little broken, but for the most part you can use the detection bar against enemies and it's a very helpful tool in a lot of these games. And the fact that you really can't do it here is extremely disappointing and detrimental to the stealth system, especially when it's areas where you're doing active infiltration and stealth and you're being punished for it. Now this kind of goes back to the common Combat section of the video where I was talking about how this game knows it's a Viking game and it wants you to get into combat a lot. Well, even the stealth wants you to get into combat a lot. And that's really honestly kind of disappointing because I feel like you should be able to have the approach that you want to have and you shouldn't be encouraged, especially, you know, considering the title on the box, you shouldn't be 
actively encouraged to constantly be getting into open combat. That's not what I'm playing this game for and that's not the way I want to play this game even if I have the option to do otherwise. Now the other thing that's very disappointing and encourages you to get into open combat are of course the fact that a lot of your stealth abilities are exactly that. They're abilities and they're tied to your bow. Now you do have things like little bags of sand that you can shoot and they poof up in like a little smoke cloud but they're in very specific areas and it's not something that you're freely able to use per se just because they are only in specific areas so they'll cloud a scripted couple of guards and you can go take them out if you wanted to but often they're in a position to where you wouldn't want to anyway so it's almost pointless and it's kind of in the same way as the social stealth is really scripted and in very specific areas it's just so underutilized when it could have been so great and that part is kind of disappointing but back to the abilities things like poison arrows things like sleep darts they're tied to abilities so whenever you use them you lose not only an arrow which is a resource but you also lose an adrenaline point now as of the most recent patch and this is being recorded on january 21st 2021 as of the most recent patch you cannot get that full adrenaline point if you go out to the person that you shot and you try to retrieve your arrow and your adrenaline point you can't get the full point back whereas before this most recent patch you could and that's very disappointing as well because once again it's encouraging you to just simply get into combat don't worry about stealth don't worry about taking those risks just go get into combat, don't worry about it. And that once again just shows where stealth ranks in Assassin's Creed these days. And even beyond that, simple things like detection, getting back to that a little bit, it's very inconsistent. Sometimes people will see you through walls. Sometimes people will see you at an angle where before you would have been hidden, but all of a sudden they can detect you. And it's just an entirely broken system. It's not very well done. And I don't know if some of these are bugs or if this is an active kind of thing. Obviously some of the detection inconsistencies are bugs, but the adrenaline point thing, like that's an active thing that they tune down, which doesn't make any sense. If I'm I'm blowing my cover to an extent or I'm risking blowing my cover to go retrieve an item or a resource I should get that full resource back I shouldn't just be limited to getting half of it back I should get the whole thing back and that's how it worked before and it was not perfect but it was definitely better than it is now now it's almost unplayable to play in stealth when I was trying to get footage for this it was extremely frustrating to try and play in a stealth manner and stealth through some of these areas it was just there's so many random detections that don't make any sense or are extremely inconsistent or it just it wasn't very fun and I found myself reloading a lot of checkpoints and it just uh it was infuriating now onto the social stealth which is a good aspect of it I do really enjoy the social stealth I'm glad it's in the game I think there's a ton of options that they could have used for it the problem is it's kind of like I already touched on is it's so limited not only are there limited areas where it's actually useful but there's limited areas where the story takes advantage of it and I'm talking very, very limited areas. There's very specific missions and very specific story arcs in very specific places in the world that actually give you the option to take advantage of the social stealth. That's an issue in an Assassin's Creed game. That should be one of the primary tools that you're able to use in this game. Instead, you almost never use it. It's not something they push you to go and do. They show you how to do it initially, and then from there, you can use it on occasion, but its usefulness is entirely limited. There's almost no reason to even have it in the game, even though I do enjoy the fact that it is. And once again, despite that added layer of depth, it's meaningless. And that's kind of a microcosm for a lot of the gameplay in this game is it's there and it's supposed to do things one way, but they either don't take advantage of it or that thing is not very good. Like as much as I do enjoy the exploration and I'll get into that next, these three gameplay pillars that I've already talked about, the stealth is shallow as a kiddie pool. The combat is something they want you to do, but isn't very good because they take any and all depth it does have and destroy it with a couple of little things that are obscenely overpowered and then the movement is streamlined to the point of boredom and this kind of makes sense with all the people that i see on different social media platforms saying they don't have a reason to come back to valhalla and they don't after you finish the main story you've already seen everything the open world has to offer you don't have any real gameplay that's going to pull you back in sure raids are kind of fun but you've done a bunch of them already combat isn't enticing enough to bring you back in the stealth isn't good enough to invest in and the movement is very streamlined there's nothing to it there's nothing to invest in once again so there's nothing to come back to and i think ubisoft needs to focus less on the amount of things to put in the world for you to do 
because that's not what's going to keep people in the game. They need to focus more on the actual gameplay mechanics and features and make it to where people want to invest in these specific features in a way that's satisfying. I mean, for crying out loud, I love Ghost of Tsushima's exploration as well, but I can go back to it because I love the combat systems. I love the stealth systems and the ghost tools, and I can invest in each of those things. In this game, I can't invest in anything. There's nothing here. It's just streamlined open world Viking hoorah raid. And that's very disappointing. That is not how these games should be. And while there are things I very much do appreciate, I appreciate the fact that hidden blades are back. I appreciate that there's one hit kills. I appreciate that there is social stealth. That is wonderful. And I love some of the atmosphere of some of the cities, but that's it. That's all there is to it. There's nothing aside from some Yule festival or whatever live service event they want to do for me to come back to these games. Instead of giving me more content, give me quality content that I can invest in. That's why people still play the Ezio Trilogy. That's why people still play Assassin's Creed 1. That's why people still play Black Flag and Unity. Even though those games have problems, they have mechanics you want to invest in. Not just that you can, but you want to. And that keeps the player engaged. That keeps the player coming back. Not just more mindlessness. And that's something they need to consider for the next title, but also something that I hope is a little bit more polished going forward with patches and something that maybe they introduce with some of the DLCs. Maybe Maybe they add some more depth to these mechanics and fix some of the things that have kind of been changed in recent patches. Okay, so I know so far I've been pretty tough on Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but that's okay because now we're going to talk about one of my absolute favorite parts of the game, and that's going to be the open world and exploration. Mechanically, exploration is done very, very well. Rather than have everything on the map listed as what it is, you actually have a color-coded set of dots, and each one is going to indicate generally something different. Gold, of course, is going to be wealth. That's pretty easy to put two and two together there. Usually, clusters of gold will indicate a raid, which, as you further uncover it, will be marked with two crossed red axes. And then the individual gold dots around the world can indicate many things. Sometimes it can be something like precious metals, which you can use to upgrade gear. Or it can be gear sets or gear pieces themselves that sometimes even have really cool stories tied to them. For example, the Hidden Ones set that you can find in the Hidden Ones bureaus around England. And as you go around and find them, you can find not only the Magus Codex that Hytham tells you about, and it's a really cool insight into the Creed, and it was just some phenomenal pieces of lore within the game that I really enjoyed regarding questions about the Creed and the early Brotherhood. And then you also have some information about the Hidden Ones evacuation from England as the Romans were pulling out of Britain. And it's just a very cool thing to do, and it's just so awesome to go in and see these old bureaus from the origins of the Brotherhood and how they seem to have flourished underneath the Roman Empire and some of the things that they were able to accomplish. There's also things like Thor's set, which can be acquired by defeating the Daughters of Lyrion, which again has its own story that follows the Daughters of King Lear and their attempt to take over Mercia and become king. And, you know, you'll hear some lines of dialogue from the different daughters about, I could have been the Lady of Mercia and things like that. And it's a really cool storyline, even though I'm not a big fan of the magical boss fights. It's a really cool storyline that will lead you along to get another gear set. And personally, I feel like there should have been more things like this to acquire the various gear sets. For example, Magister Vitus his tomb is in the game, but so is his gear set, but neither of them are related in any kind of way. And I feel like having more of these stories that are attached to the gear sets and being able to go along and explore and be rewarded properly for exploring these stories within the land, I think would have made some of the exploration far more satisfying, especially when it comes to finding the gear sets and tying them to the history and the lore of 9th century England within the universe. 
Now you can also find new abilities or upgrade current ones in this way by locating various gold dots that are going to be books of knowledge. These are going to have little puzzles attached to them that are of course worth it to solve because this is going to help guide Eivor in what he or she can specialize in both combat and stealth. And even though I didn't find many of the abilities to be something that I heavily relied on in combat, it's still something that can be very useful, especially when you're in a pinch. Beyond that, we have blue dots, which are going to be mysteries. These can be anything from boss fights with the lost drain gear of Ragnar Lothbrok to just little bite-sized world events that are going to give you insight into the life of people of England in this particular time period. And it's a really, really cool thing. Some of them are, of course, forgettable, but some of them are interesting, even though they revolve around seemingly mundane tasks within England. It's just nice to see how the people of this time period were living, and in my opinion, adds a bit more sense of immersion into some of the not only serious things people are going about doing and things that you can take away from those, but also some things that just seem a little bit silly and add a little bit of a lighter tone to certain areas. It feels like there was a decent balance between the two, at least in my opinion. Now, there are also larger mysteries around England that tie to the entirety of the land itself and its history. I've already talked about a couple of them, but of course there's others like the different puzzles that you'll have and tablets that you'll be able to collect in order to find the Excalibur. That's a really, really cool thing. And things like that are often not directly marked on the map until you actually uncover them. And this adds a ton to the player's sense of discovery. There's also the fact that a lot of places of interest like this are very interesting to look at from a distance they catch your eye very, very well, and that's very important in a game like this. I'll never forget the first time I came across an Animus Anomaly. At first, I thought it was a tree struggling to render out in the distance. As I got closer, just out of curiosity, because I'm like, I gotta get footage of this tree that just can't render because this game is so buggy. As I got closer, it turned out to be one of the coolest mysteries in the entire game, and I was thrilled to stumble upon it in this way because it was just fantastic and it added so much, not only to adding mystery initially as I was starting to get into the game, but as you go about it, it's so worthwhile to be able to complete this set of mysteries and see what kind of rewarding thing is at the end. And that was just very, very cool. And I was utterly thrilled with it. And personally, I would have liked to have seen many more mysteries like this one because those ones, they felt like they drove at the purpose of the game and what it was trying to do and what Eivor's goals are, or at least I guess with the Animus Anomalies, it's more so what Layla's goals are in the modern assassins. But you know what I'm trying to say? Just more things like that rather than more magical boss fights where there's lightning going around and Eivor keeps getting tricked into getting drugged by some magical powder because we just keep walking up to the same corpse three times in a row and you know it would have been far more interesting to see those kinds of things and added a lot more intrigue into not only the historical aspect of the game but of course the modern narrative themes of the game. Lastly are artifacts these are indicated by white dots now these are essentially the collectibles of the game some of these do serve a purpose like the Rigasoga fragments. They tell the story of the Sage Rig and his journey, and it ties heavily into the overall narrative theme of the game. And then, of course, you also have the Roman artifacts, which you can collect via little puzzles and things around the world. And you can turn those in at Ravensthorpe after a certain point. Octavian will show up in your settlement, and you'll be able to turn those into him, and he'll give you rewards for them. And then there's stuff like the cursed symbols that you can go around and find. And honestly, it was a really cool thing to stumble upon at first, but then this one and some of the other artifacts that you can find around the world, they just, they get repetitive. Of course, they are collectibles, so people who are completionists may find them addicting, but personally, it ended up feeling like the same repetitive loop over and over again. I just didn't see why it was necessary. It didn't seem to lead to anything. It was just there for the sake of being there and being another thing to do. And I think that having more mysteries and events within the world that are worth doing and lead to something purposeful, whether within their own self-contained stories like the Animus Anomalies, or to go and be able to find something that leads along Eivor's path and her journey and her overall goals within the overarching story I think is far more essential to getting me to engage with your world rather than just random nonsense that's just there for the sake of being there. Now in a design sense the world of Valhalla is done very well. It's designed to facilitate the mechanics of the game in a way that is very very good and this is a good thing in most open world games but much like a castle that's built on mud the foundations that these mechanics are built to facilitate 
are pretty bad. I mean, seriously, what do I need to invest in the parkour for? There's no parkour puzzles to go and explore and see what kind of new moves that I can pull off in order to make my movement around the world more efficient. I'm not going to try and get into a boss fight to test my skills and abilities with the combat system. The combat is just simply terrible and I just want the quickest way to get through any kind of boss fight and just get the reward as soon as possible so I can be done with it. And then of course the stealth is really cool and I like some of the mechanics but the game is so broken that I just I don't care. I don't want to go out doing stealth all the time. It's rarely going to work and only make me frustrated. Now I think this does also cause an issue with the presentation and atmosphere of Valhalla's world and let me be clear Valhalla does have by far the best atmosphere of any of the RPG games so far. I really really enjoy the atmosphere of this game but for example in Canterbury I can social stealth my way into the city and it's a really cool callback to Assassin's Creed 1. You really do feel the tension as suspicious guards look down upon you and the city and all of its opportunity open up to the player. Or conversely thanks to the RPG games climb anything approach you can just avoid the entire cool experience in general. It's just why take the risk at all? I'm just gonna hop on over this fence and not even have to deal with it. Now I already know the replies to this. Jaws, why do you want to take away player choice? Why would you ever want to do such a thing? Well here's the thing. I do. And I don't. Let me explain. When Altair first approaches the city, he knows he can't simply just waltz in. He's an outsider and there's tons of guards there and they would just kill him easily. He's way outnumbered. So what we as players can do is find and explore opportunities within the area. And then by doing so, we will then gain access to the city and achieve our goal in a meaningful manner. There's an appropriate obstacle, a solution, and a reward that is there for the player to experience. That satisfying moment of entry and presentation would be non-existent if Altair could just climb over the walls of Jerusalem really easily. Valhalla could have greatly benefited by evolving the system into something like mini black box missions. Maybe there is a world event that shows us a breach in the old Roman walls and it's used by thieves in the black market and we can enter in secret. Maybe with deeper options to explore in stealth that are at the player's discretion rather than scripted in certain areas, we could have moved the guards at will. Valhalla does have this issue where it presents interesting obstacles to the player, but often the solutions to overcome them are so simple and streamlined that it just never feels feels rewarding. No matter what the situation is, your choices are either going to be open combat, crouch stealth, scripted social stealth, or just avoid entirely. Quite simply, I'm not asking for fewer choices, I'm asking for smarter ones. Now to compare any game to Red Dead Redemption 2 and expect it to be better, especially in regards to exploration and world design, is next to impossible. Red Dead 2 is the pinnacle of open world games. While Valhalla holds its own in regards to points of interest that draw you in and make you want to explore, the game does nothing compelling when it comes to the world engaging back. You see, Red Dead 2 also has world events, but they're often fleeting and unmarked experiences on the map. And this makes every ride between towns or points of interest more like an adventure you don't want to miss rather than just another chore to do. By hour 100 rather than fast traveling because I've already seen every single hill in Wessex and every frozen tree or fern in Northumbria a million times, I'm actually wondering if that gang who is seeking revenge is actually on the other side of this bridge just waiting to ambush me, or what this guy who's stopping me by the side of the road wants before I deal with him like a true and proper outlaw. Essentially the world has my attention and not just for how beautiful it is. Valhalla feels as if it is on the right path, but it hasn't quite grasped what could truly make its world special. That being said, there are many fascinating mysteries to uncover in Valhalla's open world, and it very much is a joy to soak in and experience a majority of the time. Wait, who are you? Oh god, oh Jesus. Oh. Is he down? Okay. Hey everybody, your favorite person here, the Helix Store, and if you aren't quite sold yet on what Jaws Gaming is selling to you, then I'm here to let you know that we have a fantastic game here in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. It's the bestest, biggestest, openest world that you've ever seen with the most colorfulest objects and the most mythologicalist moments arcs ever created in a video game. First of all, do you enjoy a game where half of all the customizable objects are locked behind a paywall? Isn't that amazing? Do you like 
make a game that's rebalanced a month after released in order to help increase the grind for players with a massively intimidating skill tree along with time savers and XP boosters that are going to be shoved down your throat at every single screen in a gameplay mechanic that we consider creating a problem for you and then offering the solution by giving us your wallet. Do you also enjoy a game that has a paid season pass that comes with it as well and helps in no way possible with actually fixing this kind of problem that we've presented to you in the game? Do you like that? If so, you can safely say the Helix Store, where your wallet is our DNA. Oh man, oh, I think I, I think I blacked out for a minute. What happened? Anyway, oh, that was so weird. Uh, before we carry on and get into the actual story arcs about the game, I want to talk about two things that I think are more central to a proper Assassin's Creed experience than I think most people even realize. And that's going to be history and the pieces of Eden. Now, I know some people are like, what do you mean you you, you don't think people realize history and the pieces of Eden matter? I, I know that people know that. I just don't think that they've been held as centrally key pillars of these games and what they necessarily should be. And I think that this game has a couple of unique takes on them that I want to explain first. So let me first go into the historical aspect of this game, because there was a whole issue with people who were complaining like, oh, God, why can't I slaughter everyone? That's not historically accurate. The Vikings slaughtered everyone. Grrr, and they were just really mad about that. Now, the thing is, I can't play this off as Eivor's an assassin who's just following the assassin tenets. She's not. And she never joins the assassins. Spoiler alert. So it's not like she holds these tenets close to her heart. I also can't sit here and say, oh, well, the Vikings actually, they had all their actions chronicled by their enemies, and they were actually peace-loving farmers who just strolled on over to England and were persecuted. That's not the case. The Vikings were a brutal bunch who went around raiding, and they did do some awful shit. It's just so did other people that time period. It wasn't too far out of con- I mean, they were brutal, but, I mean, so were a lot of other people, is what I'm trying to say. But here's the thing. This is an Assassin's Creed game, and in Assassin's Creed, we hop into to an animus and this shows us the truth of history and again i'm not saying that this means that the vikings actually weren't brutal murderers because they were we know that regardless of what the sources are but you have to think that the main protagonists the main heroes of the series the freedom fighters who have been fighting for all mankind for millennia are actually based off of a cult of murderers who would go out to murder people to gain influence and did hash so much that it actually became their namesake yes if you didn't know Assassin comes from the word hashashin because they used hash to show you paradise and then you'd be like, oh, if I listen to the old man of the mountain, I'm gonna get into paradise. That's what they did. In fact, most of the protagonists within the games themselves stem from the villains of history. I mean, think of greedy Florentine bankers from the Renaissance. Think of filthy pirates from the Caribbean or really pirates of any time period. And even Victorian gang leaders. It's not like we're chilling with the cleanest bunch in the world here. It's a pretty messed up group of people that we're able to sympathize with and see as heroes. And that's the cool part about the Animus, is as it takes you back in time, it not only humanizes these people and turns them into humans rather than black and white figures on the pages of your history books in class, it makes them into people and it places them into more of a gray area that, while not everyone in history is going to fall into a, a moral gray area, some are a little bit more black and white than others, it does make them into people that we can sympathize sympathize with and empathize with, and that's a very cool aspect of these games and something that I enjoy a ton. In fact, the true villains here are actually Abstergo, who is in control of history. I mean, they're the Templars, they're history's ultimate big brother, and they twist everything in their favor to be able to make certain factions look better and certain ones look worse. That's how they keep control over how people's minds are. So if people found out that certain pirates were aligned with the assassins, well, of course they're going to think the assassins are bad. That's one of the cool parts of these games and the lore and the type of fear that an organization like Abstergo or their Templars can provide and why it makes things like the modern day so compelling and why these factions do create the feelings that they do when you are exploring who they are and what they stand for. I mean, if you think about it, there's only one Templar in all of Valhalla and he's one of the few kings in English history bestowed the title The Great. 
I mean, doesn't that seem a little bit funny to you? And sure, if you look at his achievements, they are definitely well earned. But you can't sit here and deny the fact that this seems like something the Templars would do, especially since he actually wasn't bestowed this title until centuries after his own death. As for Eivor and her clan, the idea of wanting to go to a new land and find new opportunities is such a human thing that many people can sympathize with. And it even has some continuity with history. When King Harold united Norway, this pushed a lot of Norse who had their own situations like Sigurd does in the story and they had to go elsewhere to find their opportunities that they felt that they not only deserved but desired deep down. And they not only went to places like England but you can also look at places like Iceland as well and many many others where the Norse did go in order to escape this place in Norway where they wouldn't have had any more glory to seek or anything else to go and do. Between this and just the general respect that Valhalla shows to historical events and figures who are significant in England during the timeline that we experience, this helps to make the game feel far more like a Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code kind of story, rather than the near Uchronia we got previously where the pyramids were being built thousands of years out of timeline and certain Athenian generals slash statesmen who, albeit had this aspect of their personality, were actually just turned into goat sex jokes throughout the entire game. I, I can't talk about it anymore, it pains me. And I mean, sure, it's not 100% historically accurate. The Vikings weren't in America in the 9th century. We know that to an extent that it was about the year 1001 that they did arrive in America. But it's something that's gray enough and something that you can explore in a fictional series like this that still makes enough sense for you to be able to suspend your disbelief. It's like, wow, truthfully, they were here a little bit earlier than I realized and adds these cool, intriguing, not quite conspiratorial, but along those lines, like there's just little truths hidden throughout history that are there and the animus allows us to uncover those and that's an awesome part of these games and why I love them so much. It's one of my favorite parts of this game and of course many of the other ones in the series. And even then, it still captures the spirit of 9th century England in a phenomenal way. I adore the way that the atmosphere is portrayed in this game depending on the various places that you are in the world. It's fantastic and it makes me feel that 9th century England and the Vikings are a near perfect protagonist and setting for this series. Now on the other hand, we have the Pieces of Eden. Now sure, they're not being used in contrived ways to have you do epic mythical monster boss fights, but they still seem to have lost their value. There are four in Valhalla. There's the Excalibur, of course, pretty important thing in English history, might, you know, consider it to be something that one of the great kings of English history and the first Templar would desire for some reason that might have to do with control or establishing his order in some way, which, you know, I mean, maybe he can bestow knowledge with it and solidify himself as the rightful king of England. That might be something he would desire going after, but we'll just move past that. Then there's Gungnir, Odin's spear, and then Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, and then that bow I didn't bother with. Now the problem is none of them matter to the overall story. It used to be that the pieces of Eden were extremely rare and powerful artifacts and only those with a decent percentage of Isu DNA could wield them without being corrupted. They were something that was key to both the ancestor and the modern day story. Now they're just used to epically bash brains in and flash lights in order to pacify the Fortnite fans that now play these games. And honestly it's just simply disappointing to see these artifacts who are once revered as these integral pieces of these games to be simply just tossed to the side as something else to collect in the world. I mean, people don't even react to them in the open world. I mean, literally, you can be walking around with all of them and no one reacts. I mean, at least in Red Dead Redemption 2, people will react to a wacky outfit. <laughs> Is that what they're wearing in Paris these days? <laughs> But apparently, in 9th century England, no one cares when an epic viking is walking around glowing like an RGB keyboard and just mashing people to bits with it. Now with all that out of the way, let's talk about the various story arcs in the game. There are quite a few. There's Eivor's personal story, which is for the most part pacifying England, but of course following Sigurd along in his story arc. There's also the modern day story, which is pretty self-explanatory. And then of course the Order of the Ancients arc, which is the assassination web. And then finally we have the Ravensthorpe arc, which acts as your home base and is similar to how the Homestead in AC3 acted or how Monteregioni and several of the other home bases that we've had throughout the series as 
life. Now speaking of Ravensthorpe, let's discuss her first. Ravensthorpe is the place that Eivor and the Raven Clan first settle when they arrive in England from Norway, and initially the first people there are of course the people that you bring with you from Norway. This adds an immediate homey feeling to the area. You and everyone else that's there are pretty familiar with each other from the initial arc of the game, and it feels like you're starting off on the right foot, and you feel comfortable despite being in a land that is unfamiliar to you. And then as you build up Ravensthorpe, you're going to have new people arrive at the settlement and they're going to offer their unique services to the clan. You can also pursue storylines in the settlement as it grows. You can cuck out Sigurd by getting with Ranvi, or of course getting with Petra as well. And then there's redemption arcs for Tarbin, which are very satisfying and nice to see, and just very nice heartfelt little jaunts to go on. Or you can get betrayed by Dag, one of the most misguided souls in the entire series. That poor Dag. I swear. Now, Ravensthorpe really does have that true family feeling. I really enjoy my time in Ravensthorpe. It feels like a true home and is one of the better settlements in the entire series. And honestly, it's a perfect example of one of the core themes at the heart of the series, and that being the family that you create and not necessarily the one that you're born with. There's also the fact that the settlement is going to act as the economic hub of the game. By raiding to gather raw materials and then going around and collecting random supply chests around the world, you'll be able to upgrade different parts of the settlement. And of course, this is what will progress it along the way and cause more people to hear about Ravensthorpe and in turn come and offer their services. Now, this is all well and good and is a very solid foundation for the game to build off of and for the player to build off of in order to follow this journey along. But of course, like most things in this game, Valhalla just doesn't. Gathering raw materials via monasteries is fine. It's a fun little thing to go out on raids with the boys and you can go and burn stuff down like our boy General Sherman and just have a grand old time about it. Now, sure, later in the game it does get a little bit repetitive. There's not really a ton of unique stuff aside from just the layout of the monastery, but I mean, who gets tired of burning stuff? Let's be honest. But on the other end, you have the supply chests. These are extremely tedious. Just to get the last two upgrades to Ravensthorpe, I had to find 24 supply chests randomly around England. And it's a very uncompelling and tedious way to go about this. I feel like if there were more ways to acquire these kinds of supplies. For instance, if you remember back in a lot of the older games such as Black Flag, Rogue, even Brotherhood, Revelations, you could send your assassins or your fleet off to go and do missions and they'll collect supplies and other collectibles for you to bring back and you can either upgrade your ship or upgrade yourself or upgrade your settlement and you can go along and be able to complete more and more missions and they'll earn progression and it's a really cool thing to be able to do and I feel like that mechanic coming back in this game would have added a a very compelling and intriguing feature to Ravensthorpe and would have made things like the Yams Viking far more useful. Imagine if you could send a Yams Viking off to another region where you had an alliance and they could complete certain missions and in turn they would bring back supplies to Ravensthorpe as part of your deal with that alliance. I think that would have been a far more satisfying way to go about those things and maybe even you can have a couple of different Yams Viking and they can go off in different ways as you upgrade the camp. For instance once you get to level 4 of Ravensthorpe you can have two or three Yams Viking as opposed to just one. And that way you can send off multiple to multiple regions and keep those alliances strong. After all, for the most part, the alliances only serve to tell stories and to show up in narrative moments. They don't serve any true gameplay features. There's no real difference between different shires when you go to them before or after you've completed the arc. So what's the point? And then maybe if you do enough of these kinds of missions in a particular shire or region, you establish a tighter alliance with the people there and you can not only trade for supplies but maybe more unique resources and you can use those to ultimately decorate Ravensthorpe in a more unique manner. Again to compare not only to the older Assassin's Creed games but Red Dead Redemption 2, the camp allows you to not only upgrade and replenish supplies via money you collect from open world activities but you can also add unique decorations and touches by gathering specific resources in the game and then Pearson will craft them in the camp. This adds worthwhile touches that make the camp feel far more unique and far more like home with your own idea of what it's supposed to look like. Of course, going back to Valhalla, we do have decorations in the game, and I think it is set up perfectly to have this kind of system here, but once again, it just doesn't. And there's not a lot of compelling ways to acquire these decorations, and while I really like the aspects that I can decorate the camp, there's just no reason for me to go out and find them in any interesting manner, so I'm not actively ever seeking these decorations, because for the most part, I can just buy most of them, and that's good 
good enough. There's nothing too crazy that I want to go and do. I'm like, oh yeah, that might give me a decoration. Let me go do that. And again, I feel like maybe having a unique decoration from a particular Shire would show not only our alliance, but add a nice kind of vibe, even something akin to like the Memento Gallery from Assassin's Creed Unity. I think that could be a very cool aspect to this game as you go back and it's almost a nostalgia trip through your journey throughout the entire game to have these little trinkets if you wanted from the different Shires that you've been to. I think that could have been a really cool thing that they just simply didn't go the distance and didn't go with the depth to be able to explore in this game and allow us to invest into Ravensthorpe in a deeper manner than simply just upgrading when we find enough supplies and raw materials and then that's it. And again, I just think this would have been perfect considering the theme of the game. You're establishing alliances within England and trying to grow your influence. I can't honestly think of a better way than doing it that way. If you go to cities, they often have a multitude of influences. Even if you go to Jorvik, one of my favorite cities in the game, they have a fantastic multitude of cultures mashed together there. And that's what a true thriving city would look like. So wouldn't it make sense that a powerful place like Ravensthorpe is trying to be when they want to show that in their trade with the various places within England? Again, I think it's just a missed opportunity with this game and something that I would hope that they maybe add with one of the DLCs or something that they consider for future titles. <sighs> So then we have the Order of the Ancients arc, and as the name would suggest, it ties into the Order of the Ancients assassination web that you're going to find on the menu. Now these tie into those really, really awesome city arcs within the game, and you can also do the individual investigations into a lot of the members in the open world, and you'll find them hidden across England. This is also where the zealots who act as the enforcers for the order are going to come into play. Now these guys are formidable opponents, albeit if you have those cheat codes that we discussed in the combat section of this video, then you're going to be good to go. But I will say that a decision early on in the game is going to determine if they're going to actively hunt you or if you can be the one that's on the prowl against them. It's really up to you how you want to go about that. But regardless, they are very cool. And each member, zealot or not, of the order is going to have their own unique backgrounds and reasons for joining the order and believing in it. Some are going to be true fanatics like Folke, who believe in the philosophies of the order very deeply and hold that core to themselves as people. Others are going to see it as just an opportunity at a life that that they may not have had otherwise and this makes for a very unique look at the order and makes it seem like these people are actual people who just happen to believe in a flawed ideology in order to control others and to rule over others this also allows us to see the order in a way that they're not just reskinned versions of the templars they definitely have their own unique beliefs and are actively aware of and in search of the isu and their artifacts in fact, rather than believing that God lives under the Vatican in the vault, they do seek to understand these artifacts. They do not deny the so-called gods that you hear them reference over and over again throughout the game. They embrace them and they structure their order in a way that would reflect the Isu. In a sense, they are far closer in ideology to the instruments of the first will that we've come to know in the modern day than they are to the Templars that we've come to know in many of the games. That being said, they do still have an affinity for backdoor deals in order to gain control and power, which is a pretty common theme between the two organizations. In terms of mechanics, the assassination web is done fantastically. It is such a fun part of this game. You're going to go out and uncover clues to members via the story arcs, which means they're just going to occur naturally, or you can actually go about and follow up on leads that you'll find in the open world, and doing so will help you to locate some of the members of the order. As for the members that we take out during these story arcs, it's done in a near perfect way way, albeit with a little bit of nostalgia sprinkled on. But even the grunts that we locate in the open world through those small investigations are taken out in a very satisfying way. I mean, just following up on a couple of clues and locating Evil Bob Jr. just to take him out is a pretty fun thing to do in the open world. It's far more rewarding than some of the simple assassination contracts that we would get in previous games where it's like, here's a small backstory, he's over there, go kill him. You have a little bit of investigating to do, and I really, really enjoyed that aspect 
aspect of it. But I gotta say, for the Magisters and the other higher-ups within the Order that are not taken out in a story arc, it was pretty underwhelming. For example, Gorm. You have an entire arc dedicated to him. You actually have to leave all of your equipment in England and go to Vinland, and the reason you have to leave your equipment is because you have to essentially disguise yourself as a thrall or a slave on a ship that is headed to Vinland. Doing so means you show up with no equipment, and you must scavenge around for supplies in order to get this equipment that is unique to this particular region. This creates a really cool, large puzzle that the player must solve as they go through the arc, before eventually taking out Gorm, and it's a very satisfying conclusion not only to his character but to this little piece of the story, and also does some service in order to help build up Assassin's Creed 3 with a couple of easter eggs thrown in that is quality fan service. It's not just there simply to be there, it genuinely has a cool purpose within the game and does make a lot of sense. And I'm not sitting here saying that every single Magister in the game needs an entire story arc. It would have been cool if that was the case, but that's just not the way this game was designed and built. But for the ones that do, like Gorm and Folke, they do so for main story purposes. Regardless of that though, these guys are higher ups within a very powerful and shadowy organization in England. And I think the idea that just walking up to a guy in Grantabridge and killing him without any kind of guards around or assassinating the Shire Reef of Yorvishire while he's just kicking it by a waterfall, that doesn't serve for a totally satisfying ending for these people who are built up to be very important players. When you find them, they just seem like random people. And I can see how in a sense they would do that because they want to just blend in with the people of England. But you would have to think that the more important you were in the order, the higher role that you're probably going to have in England. I mean, King Alfred is the father and he's the King of Wessex. That's a pretty important role. I would think that there would be more people in those positions that would have higher roles, be it a lord or be it a high priest or bishop, something along those lines. Instead, we just have these randos that are chilling in the open world and there's no satisfying gameplay puzzle to go and find them once we complete our investigation. That being said, it is still one of the absolute best parts of this game to go and do these investigations. I really enjoyed finding the clues and the build up to finding out who each and every character was within the order before eventually taking them out. And story wise, Falke makes for a very cool and crazy villain. I really enjoyed seeing her and of course hating her character for the things that she did. We also have Alfred who's the father of the order. And even though his story is a rehashing of Aspasia's from Odyssey, it does serve a far greater purpose as he's the founder of the Knights Templar. It's a very cool thing that we get to experience within game. And honestly, in a sense, it does make some sense that Eivor has no context for such things because she wouldn't be aware of what exactly she was doing. But how poetic would it have been if an assassin had indeed been the one to aid in creating the Knights Templar? It could have been a lesson that ruthless pursuit of cutting heads off of snakes could ultimately and eventually lead to one that was far worse than the one you were already fighting. It could have been a philosophical journey where Eivor must consider her actions in regards to blind conquests and a look at the creed that her and Haitha must take that questions it and the themes of the Magus Codex. It would be a lesson they must take and share with their brothers and sisters around the world. In fact, a small cutscene showing the consequences of allowing Alfred to live in his victory at Eddington in 870 just months after the victory at Chippenham could have served to solidify this lesson that allowing a poison to live despite it being founded on good intentions is beginning to spread and undo the work of the hidden ones. It's a poison that knows no creed and can creep in and consume any society. It's a force that would haunt the assassins for the rest of time. Instead, we get this. Wonderful. With his abdication, the last stronghold of the order has been dismantled. All that remain are scraps here and there, and you, Eivor. Now that you have seen our enemy and you understand our cause, I wonder if you would join us. Become a hidden one. Was this your ultimate goal, Hytham? A trial by fire? It is a kind offer, but I do not believe we fight for quite the same cause. Your creed demands that you keep your triumphs hidden. I prefer my glory to be in plain view for all to see. If I taught you our creed, if you spent time with it, it could open your mind to another view. Another view is always welcome, but to live without celebrating one's glory and honor and achievements is not a life for me. 
Okay, okay, so everything in Valhalla so far has been pretty hit and miss. There's nothing that's just obscenely bad, is there? Yeah, there is. It's the mythical arcs. They are pretty bad. Now, before everyone starts crying and telling me I don't understand the mythical arcs in the game or the story they're trying to tell, I do understand them and I actually can appreciate with what the writers were given, what they were able to tell as a story. It was very good, again, for what they're given. But at the end of the day, it still doesn't make it great. The big issue is the kind of box that they're only allowed to work within. And there's a lot of things that come from this. First of all, gameplay wise, the Asgard arc might be one of the worst sequences in the entire series. Unlike the Vinland arc, Asgard offers literally nothing unique aside from artificially extending its length by making you climb up and down cliffs over and over again with the mind-numbingly dull parkour. Jotunheim, at least on the other hand, is a bit better. By being less cliffy and having more unique puzzles featuring the Jotun magic, it is pretty fun, albeit it's confusing at first, but once you get a hang of how to solve those puzzles, it does get pretty easy. Regardless of all that, I felt like I was entirely removed from the game that I paid 60 plus dollars for, and honestly, for the entire Asgard arc and parts of the Jotunheim arc, I just wanted it to be over almost as soon as it began. Story-wise, Asgard feels even more out of touch, and sure, I know exactly what they're trying to set up, but mythology shouldn't reflect exactly what happened to the Isu. In my videos where I discuss Proto-Indo-European parallels, I talk about how all Indo-European religions consist of common themes but are never identical. In in a way, the same should apply to the Isu. For example, Jupiter and Minerva were not actually named that as Isu beings. Their names were Tinia and Merva, but they were gifted many names by humans who saw them as gods. So then why are Odin, Loki, and Thor actually Odin, Loki, and Thor? And why does Norse mythology exactly replicate the events 75,000 years later? Again, going back to the Proto-Indo-Europeans, we know that the Isu language that we see in game is designed specifically to be an ancestor to the Proto-Indo-European language that we know all Indo-European languages branch off of today. So in that sense, shouldn't the events that took place with regards to these Isu members reflect that same kind of design? That rather than trying to be exactly what the Norse see, and yes, I know that there is kind of a Norse skin over everything because of Eivor's imagination, and it actually was the Isu world, but I'm saying the events specifically involved people who are characters in Norse mythology. Shouldn't those events be be very different. Shouldn't the Isu beings themselves, the characters of this story, shouldn't they be vastly different than what the Norse religion interprets them as? That takes away from a ton of the mystery. Ultimately, it just ends up not making much sense in regards to the rest of the precedents set by these Isu storylines that we have uncovered so far in the series, and in a historical sense, it also makes literally no sense. I mean, again, we have people like Adam and Eve who are human Isu hybrids who take an apple of Eden because it doesn't have the same effect on the synapses in their brain as the other humans and they go about freeing humans and starting a war with the Isu. That is a far cry from the story that we read in Genesis. So again, in an Assassin's Creed sense, it doesn't make sense and then historically, I mean like I said, in just 6,000 years, all Indo-European religions and all Indo-European languages descended from the Proto-Indo-European language and religion and look how much they've changed. Changed. So you're telling me in 75,000 years, the Norse religion has exactly reflected what events happened to the Isu in that part of the world. That makes literally no sense. So it's terrible gameplay wise. They did the best they could story wise. And I hope I never ever have to play this part of the game again. As for the actual main story, we're back in hit and miss territory. The focused linear segment in Norway is utterly phenomenal. I was hooked. At first, I felt sympathetic for Eivor and the things that went down in her childhood and the loss of her family. And then we get to see her grow up and turn into the badass Viking that she really is. There's a really cool introductory scene that shows off the revenge that Eivor is after, but we also learn that in her passion, she also can put the people that she cares about in danger. Her character is pushed even further when we find out that as she has a vision thanks to Valka, that she's going to end up betraying her brother Sigurd. Speaking of Sigurd, when we meet him, he's a larger than life character who fulfills everything that everyone was telling us about in the lead up to our meeting with him. On his journey back from Constantinople, he brings two familiar but mysterious hooded figures that I think all fans of these games would appreciate. We then get to partake in some really, really cool moments like the Battle of Haffer's Fjord and receiving our hidden blade. Then we find out thanks to King Harold finally uniting Norway that Sigurd and Eivor have 
have been robbed of their futures thanks to a deal that Sigurd's father has made to submit to King Harold. This creates a very compelling reason for the clan to pack up and head to England in search of opportunity elsewhere, and is not only something that is a cool idea, but is a real world thing for a lot of Norsemen who had their opportunity robbed from them in Norway. Then we head to England, and things start to unravel. There are a lot, and I mean a lot, of arcs to get through, and I did enjoy a vast majority of them, but I was honestly just so done with the grind by the end that I probably would have enjoyed quote unquote the less integral ones even more had they not been mandatory to get Sigurd's ending. There were definitely some moments where I was really pulled into the story, most notably after the Kent arc when we find Sigurd's arm under Canterbury. But then, even though I do have the option to head straight to Suthix as you would want to do, we do get told by Ranvi that it would be wise to seek other alliances, and so I do that instead because I don't want to risk not being able to save my brother Sigurd. But on the flip side, had I chosen to go and save Sigurd first and had this really cool moment where we rescue my brother and then go and have to do these other two arcs that I'm going to talk about here in a second, that still would have broken up the story in a pretty poor manner. Either way, I'm off to Lincolnshire. And honestly, Lincolnshire turned out to be a pretty decent arc, and I really liked Hunwald as a character. Essex, though, is where the issue starts to rise. It's a typical bad lord who doesn't care and fixed marriage both parties want out of kind of story. Sure, we meet Rollo, who's a really cool historical figure who will certainly be important for the Siege of Paris DLC, but like many of the unofficial side arcs in the game, it only loosely ties into Eivor's goals, only doing so in that it provides another alliance. Overall, all, it does nothing else to aid us in our quest to either find Sigurd depending on when you played it or to help further Eivor's power necessarily. Sure it's another alliance but that's about it and the pacing and the setup of it. It just doesn't make sense. It just feels like a random quest thrown in there just for the sake of having it in there. If anything it dulls the emotional attachment that I have to the story and to the characters. That being said I can't appreciate the idea that the narrative is designed as a genuine Norse saga. It's a very cool idea idea, and many of the characters are written extremely well and are memorable despite the little amount of time that we have with a good amount of them. This is a huge testament to Darby and his team of writers and their ability to craft memorable stories. As the game went on and on though, I just began to feel a sense of resentment. Why can't this just end already? Why do I have to fight Vili's dad's ghost? Am I seriously trick-or-treating right now? I just want to find Sigurd. I feel as if many of these arcs being optional stories you discover would have aided in the experience not only in reducing the grind but adding to a sense of discovery. Then we have the major crime, the fall off of the Hidden Ones storyline. Sure, we have the Order of the Ancients story arc and the Hidden Ones bureaus, but Eivor has literally no context to what is happening, what she is doing, and she can't read the codex or anything that has to do with anything I care about. She's only aiding Hytham and Bassam to gain yet another alliance. Now, we do have some incredible missions initially, like Bassam teaching a social stealth and Hytham teaching the leap of faith to Eivor, but it pretty much ends there. I think a huge missed opportunity for the game would have been Eivor and Hytham discussing the codex in certain areas once maybe she brings it back to him and she's like, hey Hytham, I can't read these but I'm curious to know what they say. I think that it could have led to some very cool moments, more of those campfire moments that we have with Bassam, but instead we can have them with Hytham in Ravensthorpe. We could also have Eivor come to Hytham and discuss some of the concerns that she has based on the Order of the Ancients members that she's taken out so far and some of the things that she's learned from them and what they're saying. I think this would have furthered Eivor's character far more and would have made Hytham more than just a glorified librarian. He may not convince Eivor to join the Hidden Ones necessarily, but at least we could have more insight into her thoughts and feelings. She may even take away some of what Hytham has to teach in order to better rule as a Jarl. Beyond this, and intertwined with the story, is of course the modern day storyline. The modern storyline is honestly the best since Brotherhood and Layla truly comes to shine as the main character. There are also some great bits of lore and insight into Desmond just before Assassin's Creed 3's ending hidden on the laptop. There's tons of really cool files that seem to definitely impact Layla and her decision at the end. Sean and Rebecca being back also works wonders as they are the perfect support team for Layla and her specific situation. It's just nice to have these characters back that we've spent so much time with and see how they've grown from their experiences. There's 
a sense of comfort not only for Layla, but for the player that helps you to better digest the dire situation that is at hand. Speaking of the dire situation, let's talk about that ending. To me, they intertwine beautifully, both Eivor's and the modern days. I love how Eivor decides to fight for the living and her rejection of Odin is honestly one of the more iconic moments in the series for me. Although it was odd that after all that, she didn't seem to comprehend that Bastion was Loki and his beef with her and Sigurd, who is Tyr, it just seemed pretty inconsistent to me. But we then have a discussion with Sigurd regarding the outcome of the five potential Sigurd strikes, and these will determine if he will stay in Norway or return with you to Ravensthorpe. After all this, we are thrust into the modern day's ending sequence. The team knows they must find the Yggdrasil tree in Norway and turn it off to stop yet another cycle of apocalypse. This works and Layla has a beautiful moment with Desmond who is now the reader in the grey, and symbolically they appear to be Adam and Eve returning to the Tree of Knowledge. This completes, or seems to, the storyline where Subject 16 told Desmond to find Eve, and thus they will now look to end the cycles of apocalypse together. Now, Bastion reincarnating and coming back in a wolf t-shirt is a bit wild, but it's a far better excuse than what Assassin's Creed 3 gave us after that end in order to keep exploring the ancestors' memories. Hopefully Bassum coming back is meaningfully explored in DLCs, or the next title. Regardless, it's the best modern day ending we've had in quite a while. But to be honest, that's really by default, considering the last time I had this many questions after an ending was probably after Brotherhood. Either way, I enjoyed it despite the absolute insanity and I'm very curious to know more. Bassum then hops back in the Animus to get the bleeding effect for honestly who knows what reason he's a fully trained hidden one and a formidable opponent already. Maybe he just wants whatever edge Eivor seemed to have over him, I I'm not really sure, but we do finally see Eivor take the reins of Ravensthorpe with or without Sigurd, and she has a heartfelt speech to bring the clan back together, once again and solidify her position as Jarl that she performed so well in Sigurd's absence. In conclusion, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is a game that I both love and hate. It has some beautiful highs and painful lows. It tries to be something for everyone, but because of that, it can't entirely please anyone. A great example, of course, has to do with the sages. Through Eivor's story, we learn that to be our own person and to serve those that we love around us is what matters above the simple glory and power that Odin can offer. This is a very human message that fits well in the series. Eivor doesn't need Odin to rule the Raven clan. She's suitable enough being herself and can accomplish great things in that way. Again, the theme of being a human and a divine or special heritage meaning little in the way of what someone can achieve, either good or or evil is at the core of this series. But at the same time, it does seem to matter, albeit in a different way than how Odyssey handled it with you being a demigod and all. But most major players in both England and Norway who achieve quite a bit are sages in the game. Outside of Eivor, Sigurd, and Bassam, there's King Harold, who unites Norway under his rule, he's a sage. Halfdan, who is considered the king of the Danes, is also a sage, as is his right-hand man Faravid, who ultimately betrays him. There's also Svala, who's Valka's mother and a respected seer, as well as Rig, the star of the Rig Ogre and a couple of others that are sprinkled throughout. To me, while I would imagine this isn't the intended message, it seems as if you do need some sort of divine heritage to achieve something in life. Sure, many characters in the game are not sages who do play an important role, and again, there are characters in the series who have a decent amount of Isu DNA, but that merely allows for eagle vision and the ability to wield the pieces of Eden. Altair never did heavy drugs to see Jupiter's memories, and Ezio didn't have one-on-one -on -one consultations with Minerva after he got a kill. Again, it's not the intended message, but it's still in Valhalla nonetheless. The game just can't decide. There are siege battles, but also conspiracies to uncover in the gutters of cities. Social stealth is back, but it's hardly used. Areas are built to facilitate parkour, but there is no depth to the parkour. I love and adore individual aspects of this game, but I'm entirely disappointed and borderline resentful of others. Going forward, Ubisoft needs to decide. Is this a fantasy RPG cash grab, or is this Assassin's Creed? Will it have deep and unique movement systems with satisfying stealth the game will take advantage of, or will it be another attempt to clone The Witcher 3? As of now, there are two games, two souls even, within Valhalla, and they come together to make a pretty good game. But I can't help but imagine the two great games that they could be if allowed to flourish separate from one another. I know because I've seen one of them do it before, and it very well could again. To hope for this though, is a fool's errand. Valhalla puts some of the pieces back for me, but it is what it is for many, many reasons. I guess what I'm really trying to say here goes back to the roots of the series. I applied my heart to wisdom, to no folly, 
and madness. But I perceived that this also was a chasing at the wind, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. To my knowledge, although it tries its damnedest at times, this game is not at all what it could be, and it most certainly is not what it should be. Thank you all for watching.